number 200, O Love How Deep. Now leading us in prayer is Pastor Mike Passarilla from Christ Presbyterian Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we come to the close of this Christmas season, we thank you for the inexpressible gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for revealing yourself to us sinners through him, and we thank you for seeing us in him. God, we thank you for all the gifts that you've poured out upon us because of Jesus, uh, not the least of which has been the fellowship and the hospitality of this body of your people here in West Monroe. Thank you for gifting us through their ministry to us. And for these men whom you have brought to open your word, to reflect upon it, to look at your workings in history, to teach us. And so we ask that you would bless your servant as he comes again. Lord, we know this is not the happy topic that we would first want to look at. But if we would not be just bystanders at the gates of hell, but rather to storm them, Teach us and keep us faithful for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we welcome Dr. Gagnon, I just want everybody to know that uh, he, ha he tried grits for the first time today, and uh, he did not like them, so maybe we should not apl applaud for him. Let's give him a warm welcome. I am so sorry. I tried to like them. I, I really tried to have the best attitude possible. And as Drew knows, I even gave it a second chance. And sorry. But I, I think 
the fellowship and partnership in Christ and the spirit of Christ can overcome this grits chasm <laughs> that we have between one another. I would dedicate myself to bridge that chasm at the very least. All right. I feel like I'm already out of breath because there's no way we're going to cover what I plan to cover. There's no way that this is humanly possible. So let's just, you know, whatever happens in the power of the Spirit, let it happen. So I'm going to start with the Romans 1 text. Therefore, God gave them over because of the desires of their hearts to an uncleanness or sexual impurity, a carthosia. We saw that already in the vice or offender list in Paul to an uncleanness or impurity consisting of their bodies being dishonored among themselves. It's a very important reflection when people ask, what really is the problem with homosexual practice? Paul identifies it as a self-dishonoring. This is very similar to what we saw in looking at the Genesis creation text, both in Genesis 1 threatening to mar or efface the image of God stamped in our being. That's a form of dishonoring. Or in Genesis 2, in using the term selah, side, so constantly used with regard to the side of sacral architecture to view God's design, sexual design of human beings as sacred and holy and therefore the violation of that design, a desecration. And here Paul uses that similar language, though in an honor-shame culture, to refer to a self-dishonoring that takes place. I say that because sometimes we try to identify what's most problematic about homosexual behavior based on some amount of measurable harm And while there is a disproportionately high measurable harm that attaches to homosexual practice, virtually no sinful practice always produces harm in the participant in all circumstances. So you have to combine a scientific argument with a nature argument, or in this case, a scripture slash nature argument. And then he parenthetically starting in verse 25, recalls the main point that he had made in 118 to 123. The, very, the ones who uh, dishonored themselves gave, and God gave them over to, to the desires to do things that would dishonor themselves were the very same people who exchanged the truth about God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. What happened there? Oh, did I go in the wrong direction? Somehow I did. We're experiencing minor technical difficulties here. Well, let me get my uh, paper here. The Berlin Wall, did it come down fast enough? Talk among yourselves. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Little Wizard of Oz echo there. I don't know what happened just then. That was satanic. But now we're back, <laughs> we're back on board. <laughs> Continuing, because of this, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. Even their females' external use to be understood of the male as regards sexual intercourse. They exchanged that natural use for that which is contrary to nature. And likewise, also the males, having left behind the natural use of the female, that is, as regards sexual intercourse. Behind this is Paul's understanding of intentional divine design of the human body to make male and female complementary or compatible to each other, sexually speaking. Left behind the natural use of the female, and they were inflamed with their yearning for one another, Males with males committing indecency and in return receiving in themselves the payback necessitated by their straying, that is, their straying from the truth about God to idolatry. 
Now, there are three main arguments for discounting Paul's witness. One is the exploitation and promiscuity argument, allegedly that Paul only knew about exploitative and promiscuous forms of homosexual practice, and had he known about committed homosexual relationships, he probably would have changed his view. These are all what we call new knowledge arguments, so-called. They operate on the assumption that we have radically new knowledge today that allows us to circumvent the biblical witness. My argument is we don't have radically new knowledge today. The orientation argument that Paul had no concept of uh, directedness of desires for members of the same sex, what we call homosexual orientation or same-sex orientation. The misogyny argument. This is the argument that Paul feared homosexual practice would upset a nice, neat, hierarchical differentiation of men and women. There should be leadership on the part of men in a marriage relationship in relation to their wife. They would take this as misogyny, women-hating and then apply that to the issue of homosexual practice. How so? Well, if you have two males, one's on top, one's on the bottom. The one on the bottom is playing the role of a female, playing a subordinate role which should only be for women. This is how the argument goes. And in a lesbian relationship, one woman is on top, taking the man's role, therefore blurring that hierarchical differentiation between men and women such as it is. That's actually a main argument in the academy today. There is a plot structure to Romans 1, 18 to 32 within which this text falls. Stage one is God's power and God's divinity is visibly manifested in the creation order. Stage two is that human beings suppress that truth about God and foolishly exchange the true God for idols. The argument, Paul is really making a major argument from 118 all the way to 320 about universal sin, but not merely that all people sin, but that all people sin in conscious, deliberate suppression of the truth. In other words, human beings don't just sin accidentally or in the absence of knowledge, but actually in the presence of convincing knowledge, which they must suppress. As I've often said to many people, the affirmation of homosexual practice requires many years of, dedic- many years of education uh, to brainwash yourself up from what should be obvious to everybody from nearly birth on. That was an ironic reference to education, by the way. I messed it up, and that's why I guess I'll never be a professional comedian. But I carry on nonetheless. Stage three. God's wrath is manifested then in giving humans over. So human beings exchange the true God for an idol. God's response is then he hands them over to their own self-degrading desires. This is what you want to have happen? I'll let it happen. The really alarming aspect of Romans 1 at the beginning is that God's wrath is not manifested by hurling lightning bolts at people, but God's wrath is manifested simply by stepping back and allowing people to engage in self-dishonoring conduct. You see, sometimes we may think that if we sin against God and we don't see a radical and immediate and obvious punishment from God, we may wipe our brow and say, I guess it's no big deal and God's going to let this one go. But often the initial stage of judgment on God's part is when he does not discipline us, when he simply steps back and allows us to be enslaved by the very desires that we want to gratify, which mar that image of God stamped in our being. That's alarming, isn't it? Some humans even exchange natural intercourse for unnatural, especially about idolatry and sexual immorality, specifically homosexual practice, and then continues the rest of the vice list in 128 to 31, on the day of the Lord. Not a very pretty picture, I suppose, but it is good to be alerted to it from the start. 
Now, in, I'm going to focus primarily on the exploitation and promiscuity argument that people use to circumvent the witness of Scripture, particularly Paul here. There are really six kinds of arguments that can be made here, any one of which would implode the claim, all six of which make it ridiculous. My own personal perspective is why stop at one or two arguments when you can make a half dozen? Kill it and kill it dead till it cannot be raised up again. The Genesis creation argument, the nature complementarity argument, the lesbian argument, the mutuality argument, we've already done the 1 Corinthians 6-9 argument, and the committed relationships argument. So the first thing I want to know to this text Now, you know that New Testament writers can cite Old Testament scriptures, and often do. Sometimes they don't actually explicitly, verbatim, cite a text from the Old Testament, but instead they allude to it through a series of close correspondences within a limited frame of text. And they expect the reader to be biblically literate enough to pick up the illusion. It's sort of like parables, you know. Jesus could just state all his teaching in propositional statements. But when he talks in terms of parables, it teases the imagination and forces the individual to rethink normal categories. You have to do a little brain work to figure out what he's doing there. But that makes, once it's figured out, it get, makes it a little bit more meaningful and helps it to stick. Same thing with intertextual echoes. In the case that I'm going to make here, and by intertextual we mean across the Testaments, from the New Testament echoing back to the Old Testament. We can also have intratextual echoes within a given writing, looting back to other elements within that writing. So Paul is already alerting readers to this echo when he refers to creation in 120 and the Creator in 125. Romans 123 clearly echoes Genesis 126. Romans 123 says that humans exchange the glory of the imperishable God for the likeness of the image of a perishable human and of birds and of four-footed animals and reptiles. So get that. Humans exchange the glory of God for the likeness and image that is an idolatrous statue or portrait of a, of a human or bird or animals or reptiles in the image of a god. Think of Egypt. Genesis 126 says, Let us make a human according to our image and likeness and let them rule over the birds and the cattle and the reptiles. And I think that's a way of introducing the echo in Romans 126 to 127 to Genesis 127. Why does Paul only use the nomenclature of females and males and not instead talk about women and men? Because the very next text in Genesis is male and female, he made them. So when you look at this in chart form, it's a triplicate structure. You have God's image, God's likeness and image implanted in humans followed by dominion over the animal kingdom, followed by male-female differentiation. And it's basically in the same order. There is an inversion of human and likeness to likeness and human and moving from Genesis to Romans. That's because there's a secondary intertextual echo to a Psalms text that talks about Israel's exchange of the true God for a golden calf. So Paul is trying to catch two echoes at once there, and that leads to a reordering. The male and female is inverted to female and male because Paul is using an argumentative ploy that's sometimes used in debates in the Greco-Roman world between proponents of male-female love and proponents of male-male love, where sometimes the winning argument by those who are saying that male-female love is superior, yes, they actually had this debate even among pagans, Those promoting the superiority of male-female love would say to those promoting male-male love, if you want to do that, to be consistent, you'd also have to accept lesbian behavior 
which even most proponents of male-male love did not do in the ancient world. So for lack of consistency, this is pointed out, and Paul says even their females do this. But it's also a way of underscoring how corrupt society has become, right? If I were to tell you about a society where even their women are incarcerated at the same rate as their men, you would think that is a bizarre society. So Paul is underscoring how bad things have come. Now I'm going to skip this and move to a nature argument. So I dealt with the scripture argument. Their nature argument is introduced in 119 and 20. The knowable aspect of God, Paul says, is visible or apparent to them because God has made it visible or apparent to them. For ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities are clearly seen, being mentally apprehended by means of the things that God made. That's natural revelation. I know we have many Reformed people here, and you say, well, natural revelation is not really a Reformed concept, but that's okay. I already checked it out in Calvin's commentary on Romans, Romans 1, and Calvin says, oh, yes, that's an appeal to natural revelation that Paul is making. So presumably Calvin's not that bad of a Reformed individual, hopefully. Uh, So the thing is that natural revelation is valid. God does use it, but... What natural revelation can accomplish is only in the the indictment. It can actually bring you the message of the gospel. That you need direct revelation for, the direct revelation of the gospel. But God can use natural revelation to hold people accountable for what they do know and nonetheless violate, which is what is happening here, here. So Paul is saying, you know, if you're worshiping idols, God has given you sufficient knowledge about the greatness, the grandeur, the order of God in the universe, in the cosmos, just on the basis of the material structures that God made. So that if you then limit God to the image of a human, or worse, animals, you clearly are suppressing the truth about who God is. You may not have the book of Genesis or any other biblical scripture in front of you, but you know enough just from natural revelation to know that this is problematic, to reduce God to a created being that can be manipulated in your image. Likewise, this is the parallel here with the issue of homosexual practice and why among all sexual immorality or sexually impure offenses that Paul could have cited, and they are legion, he picked same-sex intercourse because that's the classic example where human beings have to suppress the truth about the way that God has made us, which is visible and obvious in our bodies. You have to suppress that truth. And it's obvious anatomically, it's obvious physiologically in our ability to procreate only male and female, and it's even obvious in our psychology. I wish I had beaten to the punch, the man who did all the therapy stuff about men are from Mars and women are from Venus. That's another way of looking at it. Men and women are, and this is shocking revelation I'm going to give you, are different. Okay, there's a great deal of continuity. We're both human, but uh, I know every man (laughs) knows this. No offense to women, but sometimes women are a little bit naive about how different men are, but men know this. I've rarely met a man who didn't know this, unless he was so puppy-whipped, he wasn't willing to express the truth in public. From that person, I wanted to put under hypnosis and subject to a lie detector test, just so we could find out. You know, some people really deny reality. It's amazing. My first teaching, just a little sidebar here, my first teaching assignment was teaching as a professor at Middlebury College in Vermont, which is, if you know anything about, is a very hyper- liberal, left-wing institution. Clearly, they made an error. It was only a one-year, <laughs> it was only a one-year fill in sabbatical position, so they, I think they cut their losses. But uh, I roomed with another faculty member. Both of us, we were not able to bring our wives up for that year, so we roomed together in a rental apartment, and he had a, a dog, and he's, he, he himself was vegetarian, and he swore that his dog was a vegetarian, if you can believe it. <laughs> 
So I devised a little test, which was, okay, you, you, get put, all, you put a mound of vegetables on one side of the room, just as, as much as, I felt like Elijah at Mount Carmel, really. <laughs> oh, I didn't call down any fire from the sky, but I put the tiniest little crumb of meat that I could put in my finger and put it on one end of the room. We let the dog out, it was no contest. He went straight for the speck of meat. Forget the vegetables, there you go. Some people live in a world of unreality and that's really what's happening to our culture now. And this nowhere more clearly than in this issue. People devise a reality that has no resemblance to what actually is. And so it's no wonder that they deny the God who is the ultimate reality. You know, before that roll call of faith in Hebrews, it defines, that writer defines what faith is, which in paraphrase is, faith is the conviction that the truly real things of life are the things that lie above you and ahead of you, which you can neither feel nor touch, but they are more real than the things that you can feel and touch and see. And the greatest reality of all, of course, is God. Pagans do not have to have Genesis or Leviticus in front of them to be held accountable for this knowledge about the way God has designed us as male and female. They are then, as Paul says, without defense or without excuse. Anapagaletos. I'm going to skip this. Okay, I have a whole bunch of stuff here that uh, I'd be happy to give you, but we simply don't have the time to do it. So I'm going to skip over that and talk a little more about continuing the nature argument. The context for Paul's argument indicates that conclusion that nature has to do with transparent observation of the things that God has made. Nature for Paul is the essential material, biological, or organic constitution of things as created by God and set in motion by God. And so if you look at every time the Greek word phusis, the word for nature, is used, you find that's exactly the way it is being used. And I'm not going to detail all the elements here, but I'm going to go to the one that is most disputed, and that is the one in 1 Corinthians 11. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man lets the hair on his head grow long, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman lets the hair on her head grow long, it is a glorious thing for her. For the hair of her head has been given to her for a covering. Well, most people say, ha ha, that's obviously ludicrous. Paul is misconstruing nature, is, uh, misconstruing custom is nature. And that obviously men can grow hair long naturally and you know, there's no real difference in hair length between men and women. So Paul misunderstands things entirely. So for them, those who argue this, nature for Paul is mere convention. But I'm arguing that it likely has a biological referent here too. Paul is thinking of the fact that head hair as a covering is a more essential feature for women than it is for men. Simply because if you meet a bald woman, you think something is wrong. If you meet a bald man, you don't think anything of it. For which I'm glad as my hair continues to thin out well into my 60s. So I'm looking forward to eventual full baldness, not. Now there are exceptions of long hair for men in the Old Testament. The Nazarite vow in number six, which Samson uh, epitomizes. And, but that merely shows that long hair in men is not as serious an offense as homosexual practice. So, Exceptions can be made to the general rule. Paul makes the nature argument here in 1 Corinthians 11 only one of at least five reasons that he puts forward. The larger issue is that women, whether women should have a head covering while praying or prophesying in the church. Notice that implicit there is that Paul is assuming that God has given women the prerogative to pray and prophesy in the church. If you don't believe in prophecy in the church at all, well, that'll cut one of the two out of the picture. 
but he is making a case for women speaking in the church. I'm trying to alienate everybody here in one fell swoop. If I succeeded so far, usually I'm pretty good at it. I, you're, you're being much too kind up until this point. They picked up stones to stone him and he walked right through their midst. Just kidding. No, I, I know you love scripture and uh, you see it as the word of God and we always reform in the direction of scripture, right? I'm always willing to change a position if it can be shown me clearly and convincingly that my view of what scripture says is, as was noted in the previous discussion, simply my interpretation and inaccurate with respect to the text, then there's no reason why I shouldn't change, right? So there's no reason to fear arguments. You just have to examine the argument to see whether it's a correct assessment or not of the biblical evidence. Paul himself distinguishes his nature argument in verses 14 to 15 from his argument based on church custom in verse 16. So clearly he doesn't view his nature argument as merely one about custom or convention. He makes that distinction. Finally, at the end of verse 16, he says, ah, oh, forget it. If you, you don't buy any of those four or five arguments, then the last thing is stop being weirdos, okay? Because none of the other churches promote the practice you're talking about. What's behind what the women, the liberated women in Corinth are doing is the view that God has eliminated any significance to sexual differentiation. Now, for them, that means no sex. And Paul wants, what Paul is concerned about, though, is it could lead to something like homosexual practice, in addition to the disruption of marriages. Again, nature here refers to observable biological realities. There is a parallel argument about the loss of head hair, some in a somewhat lighthearted work by a Neoplatonist philosopher around 400. But more significant as analogies is that this is a typical argument of the Stoics, this kind of nature argument. For example, for why men should not pluck the hairs from their legs. And this one I especially attend to, um, and uh, others of you may also appreciate that why men should wear beards. Okay, Mark, you appreciate that. You appreciate that too, uh, Drew, and uh, many others. Okay, God gave you the ability as men to wear beards. You should wear beards, right? Uh, what kind of lion a male lion would be if he took a razor to his mane? You know, that's what makes him a male lion. That's his glory, Right? Well, you can see that these arguments are not all equally convincing, and it's why Paul throws in five arguments in 1 Corinthians 11, but when it comes to the text about homosexual practice, one nature argument is all that's needed. Because a nature argument is not as convincing an argument in this particular case. It's an argument for consideration, but it needs buttressing by other arguments if it has any hope of actually working and carrying the day. All I merely want to demonstrate here is Paul is thinking by nature biological realities, not mere convention. You can assess the argument otherwise. And I can bring up Stoic texts to make this point, and they are really good texts, but I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to pass by those. So for Paul, hmm, how did that just happen? Loving disposition. Now, some people might say that homosexual orientation is itself a nature argument. Well, to an extent, but it's a bad nature argument. And that is because, if you've ever noticed, you probably experience lots of innate desires to do things that God doesn't want you to do. So really, innate desires are relatively unreliable guides for determining what God's will is implanted in nature. Whereas material structures given in creation are much more reliable guides, much less given to being altered by the introduction of sin into the world. The introduction of sin into the world doesn't change male-female anatomy and physiology, but it does change a whole host of inner desires, including attractions. The real issue here is the absence of a true gender complement. Turn your way away from this picture if this bothers you. I actually went to the British Museum in London some years ago, and uh, then I went into the uh, 
to, to the gift shop to see if I could get anything for my wife, and there were 600 of these cups lined up in a wall, facsimile. Needless to say, I didn't get one. Some Greek and Roman moralists condemn, even Greek and Roman moralists, not just Jews, condemn all homosexual acts on the grounds of a nature argument. And there's a scholar by the name of Thomas K. Hubbard, approving of homosexuality, homosexual relations, by the way, who's written a great source book on homosexuality in Greece and Rome. And he himself acknowledges that in the first few centuries AD that these bear witness to an increasing polarization of attitudes towards homosexual activity. Some think it's great in all circumstances and are all for graphic public display of it. Others have severe moral condemnation of all homosexual acts. Basic to the heterosexual position is the characteristic. Some people would, would say, well, they didn't know anything about a complementarity in the argument. It's really bizarre. This is really astounding stuff where they assume that the ancients are so stupid that they didn't even have a clue that there's a anatomical and physiological fittedness to male and female. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, the chutzpah and the arrogance of our contemporary culture. Well, needless to say, they were well aware of that compatibility between male and female. Even my dog Benji's aware of that. Uh-oh, cannot locate the inter internet server or proxy server. Oh, Lord, heal this machine. There you go. I'm going to skip over agreements with Loder. Suffice it to say he agrees. The scholar who supports homosexual practice written so, writing so much about sexual ethics in early Judaism and Christianity. Another argument is the argument, uh, argument about lesbian intercourse in Romans 1.26. Now, some people want to argue this actually isn't about lesbian intercourse. Because it doesn't explicitly say that females are having sex with females. Unlike the statement in 127, which does explicitly state that males are having sex with males. So some of them want to argue it's some other form of heterosexual practice, like for example, anal intercourse, that is being forbidden here and not homosexual practice. The problem with that is there's a likewise also, starting verse 27, which makes the two sets of arguments parallel right, both referring to the natural use. In the implication of 127, leaving behind the natural use of what? The other sex. So you would presume that the fill-in for 126 is females leaving, exchanging the natural use of the other sex, given the likewise also, the parallel nature of the arguments. Moreover, lesbian intercourse is the form of female intercourse in the ancient world most commonly labeled contrary to nature which Paul applies to it here. So a reader is already going to be predisposed as to how to read Romans 126 as an indictment of lesbianism. Moreover, lesbian intercourse is most commonly paired with male homosexual practice. Whenever male homosexual practice is discussed in antiquity and they're talking about a female sexual behavior, invariably it's lesbianism. So again, readers would expect that that's what Paul is referring to. Moreover, there's nearly universal opposition of men to lesbianism in antiquity, even if lesbianism is also the dominant interpretation of Romans 126 among the church fathers in the second to fourth centuries. Lesbian intercourse is used elsewhere, as I noted, in clinching arguments and debates between proponents of man-male love and proponents of male-female love, where the latter argue to the former, you have to be consistent, support male-male love, you have to support female-female love. Well, why, is, why does all this matter? It matters because lesbianism in antiquity doesn't normally emulate male homoerotic exploitative practices. So that when Paul indicts lesbianism, he's indicting committed forms as well. We don't know about lesbianism taking place as a pederastic phenomenon. We don't know about lesbianism taking place with call girls, for example. So when lesbianism is being indicted, you can be sure that Paul is absolutely indicting homosexual practice. I'm going to skip the, uh, the Clement stuff here as well. Oh, I already did do that. So let me move on. Whoops. Ah, yes. 
the mutuality argument. You'll note that uh, sometimes people want to say this only deals with exploitative practices where you're imposing it on another, like an adult to a young male, or in the case of a call boy situation. Notice here, mutual gratification is emphasized, not coercion. So Paul cannot be thinking of master-slave relationships in the first instance. By the way, all these pictures that I've been showing in the interim involve relatively equal age pairings of two males, not pederastic relationships. Here, two bearded men is an iconographic representation of adults. In Plato's Symposium, the comic Aristophanes is present, and he says, they, the two men, continue with one another throughout life, desiring to join together and to be fused into a single entity and to become one person from two. Does that sound like an exploitative relationship? Not to me. Present at the banquet also is Pausanias. Pausanias was a lover of Agathon. The relationship began when Agathon was 18, reasonably close to an adult, and was persisting up through the age of 31. Clearly not a pederastic relationship, and that's partly what Aristophanes is referring to. And Pausanias argues that love is neither right nor wrong in itself, but only right when it is done rightly, and for the right reasons. That lovers who love rightly are prepared to love in the expectation that they will be with them all their life and will share their lives in common, as if having been fused into a single entity with the soul of the beloved. Clearly, not an exploitative description, or even a promiscuous description. Did they know about the possibility of committed same-sex relationships? They did. And there are many other texts I could cite, but unfortunately, time is limited. But there are many examples, not just the conception, but actual examples of committed homosexual relationships in the Greco-Roman world, both between men and between women, involving semi-official marriages. And the rabbinic texts and the church father texts reject even marriage between members of the same sex. So if their only problem was the what they perceived as exploitation and promiscuity, then once the marriages were being entered, they should have approved of it. But instead, they called even these marriages contrary to nature because the contrary to nature part didn't have anything to do with the degree of exploitation or not. It had to do with attempting to fuse two individuals who in their biological composition, anatomical, physiological, psychological, are not designed for sexual pairing. Point about the biblical text. So we have some people actually honest about this. Let me move on to analogies. What is the problem with same-sex relationships? Let's say you're talking to a person who isn't a believer or a believer who wants more arguments than simply scripture is against it. There actually is rationale for this. The problems are these, sexual self-deception. When one person of one sex is erotically desirous of a person of the same sex, that person is conceiving the person of the same sex as though that person were a sexual other to oneself, a sense of gender incompletion with regard to themselves. An example, like told some people here earlier, I'll mention now, Joseph Nicolosi, uh, who worked in reparative therapy, died some few years ago, unfortunately, used to tell this story, which I think aptly illustrates the point. He was counseling a young man, and he asked the young man, when was it that he first found that he was erotically attracted to other men? And he said, I was a young teen, and I was in a YMCA, and I saw a man come into the shower I thought was a handsome man, and I said, wow. And Nicolosi said, if you could fill out that thought, what do you mean by wow? And he became pensive for a moment, and he said, wow, I, I wish I was him. That's a person who experiences some sense of incompletion in his own masculinity, which he feels can be supplemented through union with somebody of the same sex. Only the problem with that thinking 
is it simply regularizes the misunderstanding that he's not been created wholly male. And in that sense, self-deception. It's not something to be ridiculed, mocked, or laughed at. Rather, we need to work as believers to help affirm persons who experience a sense of incompletion in their gender identity, to feel whole in that identity. Sometimes we develop stereotypes which don't actually reflect the breadth of differences and what constitutes genuine masculinity. And then that forces people who experience these differences to feel other or exotic in relation to their own sex. And then at a certain point in life, that yearning for that self-acceptance, for that acceptance by key members of the same sex can become eroticized. Now, I'm not saying there may not also be predisposing biological influences. I don't see it as a deterministic biological mechanism that you are born that way. But you can have indirect biological influences that increase the risk factor for homosexual development that then wait to be worked out in your macrocultural environment within the broader culture or microcultural environment within your family and peer structures, and then incremental choices that you make, often blind choices that you make in life that limit choices in the future. But more prominent, I think, than sexual self-deception is sexual dishonor. This brings out the category that Paul was discussing and that we saw also parallels to in Genesis 1 and 2, which is treating one's maleness or femaleness as only half intact. Well, actually, this is a compliment, actually, I should say, of the previous argument that I made. Uh, What is the logic of a heterosexual union? The logic of a heterosexual union is that the two halves of the sexual spectrum, ordained by God as such, unite to form a single sexual whole. By the same token, what would be the logic of a homosexual union? Two half males become a whole male. Two half females become a whole female. That's the underlying false narrative that needs to be addressed in order to undercut the power of same-sex urges. It may not eliminate the urges. Lots of urges to sin, as I noted earlier, we still retain in life, but it will undercut its power and enable better management. Every time we feel a desire to sin and want to carry out that desire, struggle mightily with that desire, it's because we believe that God is denying something to us that is truly good and that we really do need to have a meaningful and satisfying life. And so when we think God is out to get us and not to give us the truly good thing that we seek, then we take matters into our own hands and sin. Every one of those moments is an occasion in which we are lying to ourselves Every one of those moments is an occasion where we need to learn that that idol that we have made of that object that we're going to pursue in spite of God's will actually doesn't give us what we really want and what we really need. Homosexual relations doesn't really resolve the problem of same-sex attractions. A close, intimate, but non-sexual relationship with a member of the same sex who can affirm one's sexual identity, that is helping to move us in the direction of healing. And that's how God can use believers. Another element less common than the two I just noted would be sexual narcissism, simply by definition. If you are being sexually aroused by the distinctive features of your own sex, whatever those be, whether they be physical, psychological, physiological, whatever they are, If you are exclusively attracted to members of the same sex, and that most people are operating with this self-deception, leading to self-dishonor. And finally, another argument against same-sex sexual relationships is sexual harm. As we noted before, when you have two persons of the same sex together in a sexual relationship, rather than filling in the gaps and moderating the extremes, you're exponentially accelerating the extremes of your own sex. And that leads to the scientifically measurable disproportionate rate of harm 
that attends homosexual relationships. Now, many people in society would simply want to say, well, the reason for that higher degree of harm is that it's because of societal homophobia, whatever that is. I don't subscribe to the view of homophobia because I don't think that the rejection of homosexual practice is an unreasoning fear for which I should get psychological help in the gulag. That's the way they handle things in North Korea and the old Soviet Union. You adopt a viewpoint that the state doesn't conform to the state ideology, they treat you as a little crazy so that they don't actually have to deal with your argument. And that's why the term homophobia has been concocted. Do you know anyone who has incest phobia? I don't, because it's not an unreasoning fear. <laughs> you shouldn't want incest to take place, right? Do you know anyone who has pedophilia phobia? Pedophobia. I hope not. <laughs> we should all be abhorred by the behavior, uh, be, uh, regard with absolute abhorrence the behavior in question. As it turns out, the disproportionately high rates of measurable harm for homosexual males and homosexual females differ exactly in ways that correspond to gender type. Significantly higher numbers of sex partners lifetime for males and significantly higher sexually transmitted infections. For females, lower longevity of relationships on average seems counterintuitive, I know, because their relationships are more monogamous than male homosexual relationships. But women also invest more of their identity, their self-worth, their security in relationships, both heterosexual and homosexual. And when you put two women making the same high demands on the relationship, it puts inordinate stress on the relationship and leads to higher relational turnover. Now, I'm not saying that Men are, have everything great there. In fact, men need to learn to invest more of themselves in relationships. And it's in the union between a man and a woman that you moderate the extremes and fill in the gaps of each sex. But in same-sex unions, you just accelerate the problems of that individual sex. And there's a higher in incidence of mental health problems, partly due to the higher relational turnover and partly due to the fact that women generally, because they're generally more in touch with their feelings than men, and generally have a higher social IQ than men, are going to experience higher mental health issues like depression than men. By the way, do you know with regard to suicide, uh, women have far greater suicide ideation than men. But men commit suicide at far, far higher rates than women. Men don't just think about it, they go through with it. Anyway, these differences correspond to gender type, and they're part of a larger argument, a nature argument, it would be an absolute argument that we tried to make earlier. This would be a scientifically measurable argument. It doesn't, it's not an absolute argument. It works for disproportionately high rates, but when it's used in combination with an absolute nature argument, it makes a very effective binding argument. All right, I see that I'm already out of time. So I can't do analogies, I can't do orientation, but if you'll permit me, I just want to close with three slides here. By the way, I can summarize the orientation argument. The bottom line is it's not radically new knowledge. We have plenty of texts from the Greco-Roman milieu which show that they had some degree of awareness of biological influence on at least some forms of homosexual practice and even viewed for some people exclusive orientation to one, one sex. This is not radically new knowledge in our day. It's also knowledge I would hasten to say we should qualify, but I'm just noting that there are parallel arguments in the ancient world. And some of those who believe these things, moralists, physicians, still reject homosexual practice, despite the orientation. Why? Because we're all oriented towards sin. When you think of the way that Paul describes sin in Romans 7, sin is an innate impulse passed on by an ancestor running through the members of the human body and never entirely within human control. So if those are your four main arguments as to why we should allow homosexual practice to take place, 
you've just opened the floodgates for all sinful behavior because that is the nature of sin. Why do we have the problems that we have in the church today? We have the problems because we operate with what I call different hermeneutical scales. Hermeneutics refers to the interpreted with this scale. Head and shoulders above everything else in terms of determining God's will is scripture. And the degree to which scripture is clear about a position is the degree to which you don't need any other evidence. But if you do need other evidence, then you might draw in philosophical reasoning, like a nature argument in this case. Then further buttress, experience doesn't matter at all, but because no experience is actors of the church today, the historic scale of the church for determining God's will has been inverted into a revisionist scale in which experience is put forward first, followed by scientific reason, followed by philosophical reason, and scripture has last place of importance, which means it has no place of importance, which means that Jesus as Lord has no place of importance. Now that's not a good look for the church. And that's why this issue touches so many other issues, because it leads to a way of interpreting God's will that subverts everything that God wants to do for the world by making God in our image rather than we being conformed to his. And that is idolatry. How do we determine what matters in scripture? We look at core values. When my daughters were very young, although they're very bright, uh, they, you know, it's amazing. I thought, gee, they, they're able to distinguish when mom and dad really mean something and when they have a little play to give on something, right? Like in the summertime when they were young, bedtime. Okay, daddy, please, I so want to see this. I so want to do this. Can we stay up just a little longer, daddy? Okay, all right. They knew they could twist me in their little, around their little finger. However, at home when it came to hitting one another, they knew there's no compromise by mom and dad. Now, how do they know that? Are they just brilliant? Yes, they were brilliant. But all kids know this. They're able to make the distinction. How? Well, parents often raise their voices about certain issues. Parents more consistently discipline over certain issues. In the description that parents give of what to do and not to do, it becomes clear what they give priority to. And we have the same kinds of things presented in Scripture. Not that Scripture raises its voice, but we find that Scripture speaks about the issue of a male-female requirement pervasively. That is, throughout both Testaments. Absolutely, and by the way, I'm not saying the same thing with each adverb here. By absolutely, I mean no exceptions. By strongly, I mean the offense is regarded as a severe offense, not a minor offense. And even in opposition to prevailing cultural trends that existed in the Greco-Roman milieu, which had some more significant acceptance of homosexual practice. The culture in the in the world at the time, in the Greco-Roman milieu, and before that in the ancient Near East, that had the most unyielding opposition to all homosexual practice was ancient Israel, early Judaism, and early Christianity. They didn't simply naively imbibe at the cultural well. They were in opposition to the prevailing trends, which means they had to think about what they were doing. And it's also a view that's been held in the church for almost two millennia, before things have started to unravel. Any one of those would be an effective argument for determining what constitutes a core value. In this case, all five apply. There's no question that this is a core value in scripture. Last point, and here, although I'm a New Testament scholar, I'm going to go to a church father. And that is Augustine. And Augustine used the phrase, the dictum, love and do what you want. This was once used against me by a New Testament scholar promoting homosexual unions. He said in a review in the Christian century of my first book, too bad Gagnon doesn't understand Augustine's dictum. If you love, you can do what you want. 
which he interpreted to mean if two people of the same sex love one another, they can subvert rules against same-sex intercourse, right? Now, uh, did anything happen after the first century? I don't know. I'm a New Testament scholar, right? Well, so I go up thing remotely close to the way this scholar, Walter Wink, was interpreting it. So this is the context for it in 10 homilies on the first epistle of John. A father disciplines rigorously his child, while a boy stealer, a pederast, a man who has sexual attractions for a male child, caresses a boy, which expresses love. Now, if you didn't know, if you just saw one man who looks like, oh, is this guy going to lay his hand on this child? And then you see another man, and this man is hugging a child. You say, well, of course, the guy hugging the child is the one loving. But now when you find out that the man hugging the child is a pederast, and the man who is putting a hand to the child is doing so in controlled discipline as a parent, you might have to change your image, your evaluation of the images. If any of you perhaps wish to maintain love, brethren, above all things, do not imagine love to be an abject and sluggish thing, nor that love is to be preserved by a sort of gentleness, nay, not gentleness. What you're really referring to is making an excuse for tameness and listlessness. In other words, moral laziness, unwilling to do the work in the church to bring people into a closer reflection of God, to shape them into the image of Christ. Do not imagine that you then love your son when you do not give him discipline, or that you then love your neighbor when you do not rebuke him. It's Jesus who commanded rebuke, self. You want to know what the context for love your neighbor as yourself is? It's in the verse and a half that preceded. It took me a lot of years to figure that out in academic work. Most people still ha haven't figured it out still in the academy. You shall not hate your neighbor. You shall not take revenge against your neighbor. You shall not hold a grudge against your neighbor. And if your neighbor does wrong, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you incur guilt for failing to warn them. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see how reproof is an important part of love, properly done, recommended by Jesus himself. If your brother or sister, brother or sister sins, he says, <clears throat> in Luke 17, reprove him, rebuke him. And if he repents, even, if af even after some ridiculous number of violations, forgive him. This is not love. It's mere feebleness. Let love be fervent to correct, to amend. And here's the kicker. Love not in the person his error, but the person. For the person God made, the error the person himself made. Couldn't have said it any better. To this day, I've thanked Walter Wink ever since for pointing to me to this quotation. So love and do what you want doesn't mean license to do whatever you want with another person if you think you have a loving affect. It means that you can eat, the church can even implement discipline in love as a means to turning someone away from sin, the exact opposite of what was being promoted. So everything that we've said here tonight does not have to do with promoting hate, although that's the charge that's always being made against us. You're just hateful. They say this even as they hate us, right? Whether or not it's hate or whether it's love determines, is determined on the basis of whether it's for the individual's good or evil. And God defines it as for our good because he has made us with a particular design and a particular purpose in life that honors God. And the subversion of that design promotes sin, and even harm to the individuals, as we saw, engaged in it. This is what true love is. Not the kind of so-called love that the world wants to pass off, which is an incredible distortion of the reality, like all the rest of the reality. We have an inversion of what is true. Love becomes hate. Hate becomes love. If I 
affirmed homosexual practice, knowing what I know from scripture, knowing what I know from nature arguments and scientific arguments, I could only do so out of hate of an individual. If I love the individual, I will exhort them humbly as best as I can without adding any additional obstacles through my own personality to accept the way to life that God has created for us. And to do anything less is to fail to be an emissary of the Lord. Thank you for your time. Let's stand together and sing number 147, God of Vengeance, O Jehovah. Remember that Matins is at 8.30 tomorrow morning. I think that's all the announcements. Any other announcements? Okay, let me close this in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for this wonderful day. Thank you for the wisdom that we have heard from these various speakers. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to think clearly about these topics so that we can be a light to the world and be unyielding in our allegiance to you as we, as we endeavor to shine that light. Lord, keep us, this safe, keep us safe this night and help us to be refreshed with a good night's sleep for, for uh, one more day. In Jesus' name, amen.